Right, we're going to start off actually with a quick little bit of a feedback from this morning session before we go into some more just a minute. So, the session facilitators, have you got a quick thought, just a quick, the top two or three things, on top couple of things on both questions, if you want to say what your group came up with. So, who's going first? I'll start. Yeah. Um, I think one of the main I'm sorry, sorry. one of the main things from our group was about not just how to access funding uh, and how to write a funding bid, but about mm, being on some kind of mailing list or sharing information about when funding schemes come up. And we talked about an example at the moment about this new scheme uh, from Groundwork and Tesco for the 5D bag charge funds, and it's only open until the end of this month, first round. But how do you find out about that in the first place if you're not on the mailing list or on the council mailing list for someone to tell you? Uh, and then this goes on to we have a discussion about how do you know, you know how to fill in the bid and which bits are the important bits and actually are all the rest of the boxes just really in the background and what to say to, to pick the right boxes and also which bids to go for. Is there anything? Is there any point if you've got a sort of small project and going for a national funding bid when actually you're better off going something locally you're more likely to get with less effort? Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks, great. Oh, <coughs> uh, on the uh, first question, I think that the um, Green Group was uh, looking at uh, how to be inclusive with their members, so how to make sure that all the members were being part of the, the group, not just the core people, how to extend the core people, 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 people. and also including <coughs> within that, including other uh, diversities and things like that, so, so connecting the different parts of the community, so the young and the old and the ethnic minorities as well, so it was all part of that. Uh, how to get everybody involved in it. Uh, on the second question, I think we're looking at uh, the existing groups that have been extended for a long time, helping the newer groups with their expertise and knowledge and their particularly things like the, the trustees or the community committee groups and how they've uh, developed and how they can pass that information on to other groups. Essential, definitely essential. Thank you very much indeed. Right, who wants to go next? Yeah. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, a lot of the stuff that came up for things they need help with were the same as they could offer help with. Uh, so there was a lot of, uh, you know, the expertise was that people needed was what other people within the group could already offer. Yeah. Uh, and there was also <coughs> quite a lot of talk about uh, building contacts and the flow of information and how important that was the, for, for the group. Excellent. Yeah, just hope you want to all that. Thank you. Next. Uh, yeah, um, in the first question, um, <coughs> one of the things raised was how to get new members into your group. Um, and then also, when you have people in your group, how you keep them there, keep them motivated and keep them sustainability, really. Um, and on the second question, um, without seeing the sheet, quite popular with um, contacts and information sharing, basically. Um, uh, one group, they'd gone through quite, quite a battle to find out how to set up as a group and start applying for funding. And they, they wished there was something in place that if a new group came, that they could have sort of a fast track flow sheet of who you need to speak to first. Because sometimes, I find myself in the local authority, you don't always talk to the person you need to straight away, and it can be frustrating or, or a lengthy process. So, sort of having that sort of fast track. This is how you do. So it's basically sharing people's experiences and findings to other new groups um, and whatnot. And also, there's a um, different groups had different skills and was on about maybe where some some groups had straight to one place they actually swap their skills with another group, whether that's cross border or internally. Yeah. Wonderful. That's, yeah. Again, that's what we've been saying about the whole reason for a forum is to share that knowledge, get that information together, and get it out to the new groups. Thank you, that's perfect. And we had one more group? Yes. Yeah, um, we had a long discussion about um, groups not knowing whether to be a charity or a community group, and that sort of information would be useful to have what the pros and cons each one. Um, and then on the second question, one of the um, things that the groups can offer is knowledge off from the ground, from the community, what the community wants. Yeah, excellent, very good, thank you. We've got a note of all of those. We're going to put it all together and get it out to everyone. <coughs> if you can find answers, we'll put them out there. Otherwise, we'll put the questions out there and see if the answers are out there. Some of them we can answer ourselves by working together, and others need us to look further afield. 
but wonderful. Thank you very much, everybody. Right, we will now get together on another just a minute slot. And I've got a nice little group of people. The first one I would like to bring up is Sue Tapley. Come on, Sue, where are you? Excellent. <laughs> um, are we ready? Go for it. I'm a, I'm a gorilla bollard painter, which part of the New Bloom project was to just paint the bollards at the side of the road, black, exactly, <laughs> and um, discovering all sorts of members of the community that I've never even seen or come across before and scaring dog walkers because obviously the paint's wet and the dogs like to sniff and everything so you have to sit away and getting teenagers coming up to me and just insisting on knowing how much I'm being paid and I said I'm not being paid so they wander off and they come back are you doing this for fun? yes so they wander off and come back is it to make the town look nice? yes you got it <laughs> and they go off and they come back yeah but tell us how much you're being paid <laughs> and then the other one was um, everybody gives you a really wide yeah, berth, which is really good and uh, <laughs> recommends for our painting. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
I'm really privileged that I work a lot with Amphia. I deliver some of the training for Love Park, Love Park Weeks. So come along to those free um, training events. Um, really, really good resource. I also deliver um, workshops for the Big Lunch Extras. Some of you might know about Big Lunch. And uh, you might see me in rural England as well, helping the Blanket Foundations to look after community pubs, community parks, and community shops. So that's about me. Let's um, let's start. Now, when you when you are thinking about your parks um, and your open spaces, and when you are thinking about um, pulling your community projects off. What, and from, from your stories, from, from your 60 stories, what is the main emotion that you're getting out from doing something in your community? And you said it in your stories earlier. Satisfaction. Satisfaction, that's right. You're doing something good and it makes you feel good. And once you feel good, you actually look good as well because you have a big smile and a big beam and people come and approach you. And that's exactly what you had in common with the funder. He just looked charming here, yeah. very good. <laughs> so they are exactly, the, the funder has exactly the same motivators as you have. So he wants to do good, <laughs> feel good, and look good. Okay, one more click please. <laughs> We haven't got the rehearsal. So, the feel good um, factor um, is here. So, you need to touch the funder's heart. And if you listen very carefully today, an important bit of touching the funder's heart is by telling a compelling story, a really, really strong story, why the funds are needed to, make, to do the good that you're doing in the communities. Okay? So very often, most of the time, funders do not fund because they want to fund. Funders have areas of need in which they want to do good to alleviate needs and problems. So often areas are the environment, so anything green, CO2 reduction, biodiversity is an area, stronger communities is an area, healthy communities is an area, um, skills <coughs> is an area, and bridging generations is an area. So that is something quite important when you start looking and thinking about funding. In which of those areas of need does my project actually feed into or sit into it? So if you want to look for funding for beehives, you would obviously probably go for a funder that has the, the green, the environment, the biodiversity at its heart because that's the area <coughs> of need where they want to fund in. Probably you, you'll be less likely um, to attract funding for a funder who concentrates on getting people healthy and active. Okay? Okay, thank you. So the funder also wants to look good. Not just because he can put his goggles on and look very good, because the funder is distributing very often public money or other people's money. And therefore, the funder needs to be assured from you that you can pull your project off, that they can trust you, that you're going to do the things that you're setting out to do. And the funder also wants to know from you that your numbers are actually stacking up. So how much money do you actually want from the funder? So you need to do your research and convince the funder that the funder can justify giving you the money. Okay? Now, how can you convince um, the funder? And I'm going to introduce you here to the outcomes pyramid, which is adapted from the Big Lottery Learning Zone because it's a very, very good tool to describe your project in funders' terms so that you speak in the funders' language and you can look through the funders' eyes. Now, let me just run through you 
um, um, very briefly, and then I go into more detail. Your project comprises of different elements. An activity, which is often also called an output, an outcome, and that's what makes why people feel better um, by using your space or by using your project and your aim, but also the problem and the causes and the evidence, but I go into more detail. Let's just take an example of a slide today. It's a very sad looking slide. Very sad looking slide. Actually, this slide is on its own and looks very sad. It might be an old Wixie slide, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it's sad because nobody is actually in the park. And it's even sadder because even the bin is empty. <coughs> so, if we are putting our funders goggles on and trying to convince the funder, our activity would be to buy a new slide. Okay. No funder will fund just an activity. Most funders these days are outcome funders and they will want to know how a new slide brings back the park to the people so that they have laughter and enjoyment and community cohesion and are healthier and stronger communities. Funders are funding these type of outcomes. Now, for, because we said that the funder needs to look good and be able to completely understand your project, you need to make sure that you listen very carefully at the ground to the problem and to your very near community. What's actually the problem? And in the problem of the slide is probably vandalism, underused space, um, probably perhaps higher levels of obesity, higher levels of perhaps um, mental health, social exclusion. These kind of problems are depicted almost by the science slide. So it's important that we find out exactly what the problems are and its causes. From that you can formulate your aim. So we want to bring back the park as a community hub. That would be your aim, and you still just want to buy a slide, okay? And once you have the aim, you can also formulate some outcomes. Some funders might want you to align your out to align your outcomes with the outcomes of the funder. Sometimes, when you look through very carefully, you have to align yourself with up to ten outcomes that the funders want you or what your project to achieve. So it's really, really important that you're picking funders where your project is aligned at the same level with the outcomes. So improving community cohesion, healthier, healthier children perhaps, um, bridging generations. And we had a few um, key um, words as well earlier in, in, your, in your 60 seconds, there was, you were talking about outcomes already, yeah, teenager talking to a different generation just by doing guerrilla and um, ball art painting, for example. That's what the outcome, the, the funder will fund. The funder will then fund the paint for your, for your ball art, mm -hmm. but because you're producing the outcome, okay? And you need to evidence you need, so you need to do some research very carefully about how many people will use your space, your park. Um, look at NHS data, if it's around uh, mental health, about people's health um, and isolation. So really, really look. And funding at the moment is really concentrated in high areas of need as well. So look, are, is your project in an area of really high need? If it's not, then you'll have to make an even stronger case. Okay. <coughs> and just very quickly, just for the jargon, and the funder will want to know what impact, and that's the changes over time that your project is going to make for the duration of the funding that you're going to, to, to produce. So we, you need to show the funder as well how you're actually going to monitor that. And you could do that by kind of measuring this empty space, so hardly anybody comes. And once you install the new slide, you have so many 
people coming using the slide in the park and more people come out. Um, so that's that's your that's the impact that you're making. Is that a little bit of stop to it? Could I clarify a few things there for you? I hope. Okay, so on the um, big lottery um, awards for all website, there is a very short video as well. I encourage you um, to watch to understand still a little bit more about outcomes because the big lottery is really, really um, hot on outcomes, and so are all the other outcome funders as well. But let me now introduce you to the funding mix. So how can we mix our funding up that we're not depending on any one, um, any one funding strategy? Because I really don't want you to put all your eggs just in one basket because it nearly happened to us and it set us back two years. Okay, sustainable funding. The jam jar, as I told you, what's, what's in the jam jar? The jam jar is filled by a few streams and I'd like to explain them to you because I think once you understand the, 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 the strategy, how you can um, raise funds, whether it's in cash or whether it's in kind, then this movement can really, really help. And that's taken from the NCBO, the National Council for Voluntary Organization. And it's the sustainable funding spectrum you can look at. Now, when we are when we're going up and down the high street or standing outside collecting coppers, we are filling this box, which is called the gift economy. And a certain percentage of our funding mix can come within this stream. And the donor is going to fill that stream. Yeah, the donor by giving coins or by giving time, expertise, and materials is filling this one funding stream. The next funding stream along is called grant funding and is filled by the funder. So most people, when they're talking about funding, that's the stream that you probably most are likely to think about. Grant funding, public money, trust and foundations, that kind of stuff. Now, I need to tell you that this is still dwindling, dwindling and dwindling, as we all know, because of cuts. Less and less money is made available through this stream. And this stream is highly, highly competitive because Small community groups are competing for the same streams of funding than the big charities are going for now. So you need to have a really strong case uh, to stand out there. The next stream, and if you can see there's, there's a slide down here. With, here we were 100% asking and now we're moving towards earning some of our revenue, some of our funding if you like because this is a sustainable funding mix that we're trying to achieve. So the next box is the structured market and it's filled by the purchaser. And that is when you deliver a contract. That's perhaps when you have an agreement with another company to deliver something. That could be that you're providing your parks and open spaces for um, the local um, college that wants to train a few trainees in um, horticulture and you are having basically you're having an agreement with the college to provide the space for that that would be the, the kind of um, funding that would come in here and 100 percent earning is uh, filled by the consumer in the open market and let's just dive in a little bit more very briefly so again just to illustrate again the donors, that's your rich list. I hope you all know where your rich people live in your communities. Have you knocked on their doors? I really encourage you to do that because you need to be creative in order to um, get your funding um, going. So please knock on their doors. If you don't ask, you don't get. And also you can obviously do, um, get donations online. But yes, you can have your donors up and down um, your local high street as well. 
And if you remember very, from my, from my story here, a third of our funding, nearly £30,000, came from corporate social responsibility, from the big corporate companies or larger companies who want to do good in their communities and who are looking for community projects to get engaged. So look them up on their website and a root in is very often through the marketing department of those bigger companies. But you know, your cake sale, um, your kind of your raffles, your quizzes, they all have a value because it's about spreading the word about what you're doing, about building your networks. And the, earlier you said also that you had problems perhaps recruiting younger generations or more volunteers. So those kind of traditional fundraising activities, you are still doing that, yeah? So keep keep doing doing those, but have them as a mix. Now we're just diving in very quickly in the in the in the grant funding because you want to know what what's around. Big lottery, obviously, through um, the Heritage Lottery Fund, parks um, for the parks, but that's a really really big one. So um, you need to um, you need to have the heritage aspect in there as well. Big big competition at the moment. <coughs> um, there might be some uh, European funding as well, but that will come more into the kind of skilled sector. So if your parks and open spaces can incorporate some form of training volunteers, training perhaps people out of work, then you could tap possibly into some EU funds to actually fund your parks and open spaces, okay? And the trust and foundations, you can find out in those lovely books that you can access in your libraries for free, or you can purchase them from the directory of social change. And um, also, obviously, at national level, uh, are sitting um, the env environmental companies such as Veolia, Biffa, and um, check postcodes whether you are in their catchment areas before you go any further down um, with the application form. Okay. Stay within here. Ooh. That's okay. Um, Tata's regional and local. Again, we have local trusts and foundations, and very often you can access them through um, your um, community foundations. Um, so go and speak to the community foundation. They also know where the local philanthropists, so you rich people who want to donate something, are sitting because they're actually helping um, to make this happen. Um, Nottinghamshire County Council has funding on their website. Um, so if you're from here, um, you, you need to look them up. <laughs> um, and you have at local and regional level also the community infrastructure levy, which was the former section 106. Money to get, very, it's very hard to get a hold of. <laughs> it's slashing around. But people like little Terry with your county councillor or your parish councillor and say, go, go, go. We know there is some money there. How can we access it? Um, for the good things we, we are doing, okay? And then again, as I said, there is obviously overarching um, themed um, trust grants around, so around um, health and sport, around all things green, around obesity is obviously a problem in the country, about skills, and um, the police also for antisocial behaviour has some funds for you to get hold of. Okay, next one. Now we're going back into the structured market where I just gave you an overview. Again, this is the agreements you can have. The, the NHS, for example, if you look on the, um, on the procurement portals in your area, and here I've just picked up the one for Source Nottinghamshire, this is actually completely open. Sometimes you have to sign up for, for the procurement portals. But it's very important that you start looking at procurement because it requires a completely different language and a completely different delivery um, of, um, of, of services. But what's happening generally in, in, in the funding environment is that what our, our grant funding is gets now shifted into the 
structured market, there is less and less grant money, public money dished out to communities. So your local um, CVS um, runs very low cost or sometimes free training courses as well to get to grips and to understand the jargon and what's required for you in order to be able to, um, to go down the procurement route. So I would encourage you to, 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 to have it on the radar. Okay? And finally, the open market. How could you sell your asset, your space, your, your park? Any of you selling it? <laughs> Yes, market, so you could charge store holders for fee. You, you've got green space, you've got something to offer. Yes, absolutely. So you need to see it as an asset. Commercial events, and you're hiring out your parks and spaces for? Events. Yeah. Obviously you need to manage them carefully that they don't destroy your beautiful space. But I think if you speak to the people and you know um, how big it is going to be, it's absolutely definitely feasible. Um, I love this picture. Advertising in your space and park. Banners, local businesses. Any of you doing that? Adopt the park. Lots of roundabouts are adopted. Why should the park and open space is not being adopted? Look who's adopting the roundabout. Go and knock on their door and say, can you adopt a little bit of our park, please? Car parking could be a source of income as well, if you've got enough space. Yeah? And what could this one be? Yes, grazing. Yeah, so if you've got lots of space, you could, um, you know, let out some of your space for, for cattle grazing. And here's obviously um, examples of um, events, but that could be also, you know, a bull camp, a, a buggy fit in the park, something like that, that people who are actually using your park pay you a little fee to actually using it um, for those. And obviously your knowledge as well, don't forget that perhaps, um, if you're clever, you can make other people pay for your knowledge, your advice, your experience of managing your parks and open spaces. So, lots of ideas, and obviously if you have surplus in growing anything, then the veg box, yeah? Um, so, um, all of this in your little jump and down. <laughs> Don't ask where you taste your jump and down. We had them, we had them in the, in the shops up, up and down the high street, along with the poster. Um, and we also, we, um, at the time Facebook wasn't very big, Facebook was just starting, we started a local Facebook group as well, that really helped as well, and helped us an awful lot along the, when we were actually building the park to communicate with the, with the community as well, where we were at and what we needed. So I was also asked um, to give you a few top tips. My top, my top, top, top tip is do not put all your eggs in one basket, spread it out. Really think about the mix. Because think about how, what percentage you want from your, the total amount that you need, want to be filled by those streams. So that you're sustainable as well, and that you're not kind of firefighting all the time. Firefighting funding can be very destructible, very time consuming. Um, so think ahead, you know, the minute you've got a bit of funding, think ahead and keep in touch with your funders, speak to them. If they funded you and if you're doing a good job, the likelihood is that they fund you again, will be, will be there. You know, spread the word in your community, speak to your councillor, parish councillors, to your local press, spread the word about the, all the good things and I had some really, really good stories, but also narrow down your, your, your story, probably some of you they find it very easy to speak to six, for six, 60 seconds. Some of you did find it quite hard. If you can speak, a compelling, if you can tell a compelling story in 60 seconds, then you have almost the funding in your pocket, yeah, if you can convince the funders. So think of it um, from that point of view as well. And what I said, um, if you don't ask, you don't get. So be, 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 be open, go and knock on people's doors, um, ask people, and people like to 
be asked to come and help. Um, so, so go out there and ask. And again, have clear outcomes. So what is it that you're going to improve to make better in, the, in your community if you're really serious about funding? And I think my time is up now. <laughs> Good. I had a few more, sorry, you can tag on to those just very quickly so that you know. There's obviously crowdfunding as well. Um, crowdfunding are platforms where you put your project on an, on an internet platform if you like and you need to drive, drive loads and loads and loads of traffic to it and get people to donate. Um, mostly in, in your case would be donate, but that would sit in here. But for that, you need to be really, really active <coughs> on social media, be super smart at telling your stories and pictures. So, but it's there for you in space, hype and bus bank uh, to her who are um, specialized um, for community projects. If you are, if, um, if you don't want to be super creative if you don't have lots of time filling in lots of funding applications and looking for funding. There is also the option for, for a loan. Yeah, and you, for example, if you're rural or parish council, you can apply for a loan. <coughs> and there is the social lenders under the big society capital. So think about that as well. And obviously, you could, as a community, you could also go down the asset transfer road and actually buy the space um, for your community and run it as a cooperative. It's just a few moments to think about on top. Um, and here, just very quickly, where on earth do you find um, all the funding sources? Funding Central is a free search tool for which you can sign up as well and they send you a tailored newsletter every single week. <coughs> question we had from your morning session and um, that sits under the NCBO and the know-how nonprofit sits under the NCBO as well and it's a wealth of information on tips on how to go about funding everything so I really really recommend that you spend a bit of time um, digging around on both to find out more about um, um, funding your community foundations in your area um, the CBSs in your area can help you, they can help you also with bit writing um, or they can they often put on as well um, cheap um, bit writing courses for you and you also have another um, search tool, Grant Finder and Grant Net, which you can sometimes access for free through the councils but sometimes you have to pay to actually access so lots of um, sources there for you to find. Okay. So that's um, bringing me to the end. There's your pennies. Um, so have some stamina, be creative, and um, go and get it. That's my advice. <laughs>
So we need a few passionate people to work with myself and we can keep it going. So that's what we need to think about. <coughs> so if we split up again into our groups, we've probably got about 20 minutes. So 10 minutes of question. <coughs> we can look at those questions. Okay, any questions? No, right, you want to get back into your groups?